are you, Javed sir? Very well, thank you. How are you? Fine, thank you. It's okay. I have to start this conversation with the inevitable. You know, we are going through a twin crisis right now. We are going through the pandemic, which is which is still kind of a mystery to the world. People are still trying to wrap their heads around what this is, and the cure and everything is still work in progress. And then there's the other crisis, which is a humanitarian crisis. And I think we've seen more than enough heartrending visuals of that from all around India, of migrant laborers walking home, and you know people not really knowing how to manage this, and um, all kinds of traumas that this country is pervaded with. I just want to know what you, I'm sure you've got thoughts about that. You've been sitting and wondering about it, watching it, pondering over it, anguishing over it. So just tell me what what your thoughts are about that. Well, no society is a monolith, you know. At any uh, given point of time, um, there are all kind of people. There are good people, there are indifferent people, and there are bad people. Uh, so we can see that. I mean, by and large, I feel that the urban middle class has become very insensitive. By and large, yeah. uh, we can't uh, paint everybody with the same brush. But the fact is that uh, I see some kind of uh, indifference, cynicism, uh, lack of empathy, a lack of sympathy. But at the same time, it is my information that all these people and who are in black and black are walking on the highway. And wherever they pass, whenever they pass a small town or a city or a village, everybody tries to be as helpful as possible. So there is some basic goodness also in human nature. But I suppose it becomes less or it reduces when you are in a cement concrete jungle and dog-eat-dog uh, dog, uh, culture, in a dog-eat-dog dog culture. So somewhere you develop kind of insensitivity. So I don't see that kind of sensitivity in the establishment. By establishment, I don't mean the government. I mean the people who are well off, people who matter, uh, people who are comfortable, uh, people who are middle class, upper middle class. Uh, I don't see that kind of concern and uh, discomfort or curiosity, or worry, anxiety, that mm. to be there, because it's a matter of almost 10 to 15 percent of the population. Mm. That all the people who are in such a, a undesirable situation. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, there's, there's this rhetoric that everybody is sort of pontificating that, you know, people are going to come out of this very differently. Do you really think that's true? Do you think there's a catharsis? Do you I mean, think that the same middle class that has largely been not very compassionate on, in the public domain, do you really think that it's going to, I mean, what is going to change? Are we going to be more worried about nature? Are we going to be more worried about climate change? Are we going to be more compassionate to the poor who we have allowed to live in squalor for all these years? What is going to change? Whatever happens, leave some uh, impression, some difference. Nothing passes through without making any uh, impression at all. That's not possible. It's such a major happening. People who are comfortable, who are not affected by it, who are not affected, who are sitting in comfortable houses, watching uh, uh, OTTs and uh, um, playing cards or chess or listening to good music and talking law on uh, face time and so on, they may not change willingly. People who were affected or people who are sensitive enough to see that some people are affected obviously will be changed. They will be changed to some extent. And uh, that uh, population is sizable. Uh, people who were rooted, people who had to uh, walk on the highway, people who were thrown out of their job, people on whose face doors were closed, uh, they will remember this. And uh, they will, I'm not saying that they'll become vengeful and they start planning uh, an armed revolution, nothing of that sort. Yeah. That is not that. We are not that kind of people. But they will remember this experience and they will plan their future accordingly. 
taking minimum risk. I feel that people who have gone back would try their best to find some kind of a vocation or some kind of uh, some kind of livelihood in their own environment. Mm -hmm. If they can't find that, they will try to find it somewhere near within 100 kilometers. So which is, whichever the big city is near their village or town. They may yeah. go there. The, but uh, I wonder if many people will take this chance of uh, uh, going for a job to uh, some place which is six, uh, 600 miles or 700 yeah, miles. I think they would yeah. be too insecure to come back they will be insecure. They treated like yes. this again. I but mean, but my question really is, Javik Saab, my question, sorry to interrupt you. My question really is that when people come out of this, when we say something is going to change, for example, you find that people root for politicians, this party or that party or, you know, this candidate, will they now start rooting for issues? Whoever demonstrates, whichever individual or party will demonstrate that they are standing for a particular, will that make, will that shift ever happen? There, are, there is a very, I think, let's be realistic, a very minuscule percentage that develop political ideology or alters their or political ideology and work accordingly. A common man works for self-survival. Yeah. And uh, as long as he feels that I am not secured here, he won't step there. As long as he feels it is better for me that I go this way, he'll go this way. But yeah. the fact is that there will be a lot of people who will feel that uh, perhaps the way that we had taken was not secured enough. Yeah. And uh, we should do something else. Now, what will be that something else to be seen? And in this uh, endeavor, what will happen that a lot of uh, labor, a lot of the working class that has left the big town may not come back, at least for a while. Yeah. What, so what will happen? I guess, I mean, I'm not uh, some kind of a... Uh, You're not an astrologer. Or, teller, or, or uh, as a matter of fact, uh, political scientist. But I feel that gradually what will happen in the next year or two, that uh, rural issues, issues of smaller towns will get more significance and more importance. Because the leaders of different parties will also understand that this is the currency. Not that suddenly their humanity will take them yeah. over, but yeah. the, that they will understand that this is what will sell. Yeah. So they will concentrate on that. And right. some kind of a balance between uh, will change between rural and urban poverty. Right. Maybe India will start living a lot more in its villages than it has in the past. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. How has the lockdown treated you? How are you doing? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I must be thankful to life and to the society uh, yeah. that being kind to me. So I am comfortable. I have really no problem. But it really hangs rather heavily on me that uh, while I am comfortable, there are so many people who are not. Yeah, yeah. That's me. True. I but tell me, Javed Saab, going yeah. forward, there's so much of speculation about what will happen in the film industry, you know? I mean, what is it going to look like? Theatres are going to be the last things to open up. Everything else will open up before then. Much of the labor has gone into, you know, languishing in poverty, etc., etc. What is your take? What do you I, think is going to happen? I must say, by and large, film industry people have done something for their fraternity. Yeah. I don't know about other uh, businesses and other industries. Yeah. Uh, so Pass can be remarked. But here, uh, whether certain stars like Salman Khan, like Sharo, like uh, Akshay, uh, uh, they have done a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, then uh, you know, whatever we have been able to do, we are doing. And um, as a chairman of IPRS, Indian Performing Rights Society, we have done one thing. I have uh, taken the decision. That, I will come to that later about your. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll tell you about one thing that yeah. uh, uh, we have at least around 3,750 members. Yeah. Um, that we are not comfortable that uh, they'll be economically secured uh, mm. and up enough to uh, sustain themselves. So we are sending them money on weekly basis. 
I mean, we give them for three weeks, two weeks uh, for their grocery. So we have been to it that uh, they don't go hungry. They don't get any big problem. Mm. So their basic needs, thankfully, a lot of royalty was collected and it was in the bank. So all the uh, music directors, writers who are doing comparatively well, whose royalty was this, mm. very said that please keep on giving them yeah. and uh, all share that. But uh, we should see to it that any musician, any writer who is a member and as a matter of who is not even a member. Right, right. But we know that, yes, this person is a composer. Yeah. This person, yeah. yeah, I think that's true for all the film industries. The Tamil and, uh, film yes. industry, Telugu, they've all done a lot. Yeah. And you know, this is an industry that doesn't have anything, no benefits. There is no pension, there's no nothing. Yeah. So but, maybe that should become an issue also for the film industry. But is it going to affect the way people watch films, not only in terms of structure, in the yeah. sense will people go back to the theatres? I mean, I have a view on this, but I'm more curious about yours. Because when television came, they said, oh, cinema theatres are going to go away. And then when um, internet came, they said TV and oh, theatres are going to go away. So yeah. nothing yeah. has gone away. Yeah, yeah. Cinema theatres will never go away. I mean, of yeah. course have different channels like now you have OTT so you see you saw a lot of different kind of cinema and so on. But theatres have not gone away anywhere in the world. Right. Everything is available but theatre right. has its own experience. It will yeah. Always... yeah. Yeah. So hang on Javed sir. Questions for Javed. Oh, Sonia? No sir. Send it to me. In paper. Okay. There might be some questions for you so I'm getting someone to note that for me from Facebook Live. But Javid Saab, um, coming to one of your most prized aspects of your life, which is screenplay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're the king of screenplay. Oh, no, 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 please. I'm not. Of course you are. Well, I'm working. Oh, you're the king of screenplay. Good. No, no one but Sally Javid could have written Shole. I'm quite convinced about that. But uh, one of the things that I've always wanted to ask you, you are on the one hand a poet, romantic, turn of phrase, you know, beautiful words, beautiful imagery. On the other hand, you did something quite epic, which is to create this angry young man on screen, of which the, the most dominant muse was Mr. Amitabh Bachchan, I would think. Is that like a duality, this romantic, beautiful, turn of phrase poet goes off and writes something where this guy wants to uh, are, the world. You are putting the card before the horse. I, Actually, have? I wrote, yeah, I wrote these scripts earlier. At that time, I was not even writing poetry. And uh, although I was deeply interested in poetry right from my childhood because of my family background and so on, my yeah. father my grandfather was poet, my maternal uncle was poet, my paternal uncle was poet, my great-grandfather was poet, his mother and father were poets, and her father was also poet. So okay. I am seventh generation of poets. But uh, that time, I was not a poet. I was not writing poetry. Yeah. When I started writing poetry, or these so-called romantic songs, yeah. in the beginning, there were many people who were very skeptical. A man who Gabbar Singh and all this okay, romantic Ghana, how will he write a romantic song? <laughs> so it is yeah. ultra. Actually, yeah. this came later. My poetry came yeah. later. I started writing poetry at an age where generally people stop writing poetry. Yeah. So I started, I'm a late starter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you see, uh, I mean, like, I mean, uh, I don't think it is such a mysterious thing because all of us have all kinds of emotions. The whole yeah. Uh, yeah, true. All the shades and all the uh, sargam of uh, uh, emotions in everybody. So yeah. oh, there are some high notes and low notes and soft notes and strong notes and so on. All of us have it. Uh, yeah. Personalities are also not linear. I mean, you have yeah. different at different moments. You have different moods. Well, you can be pluralistic, but you can also be multiple personalities. They're two very different things. I was just yeah, 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 yeah. more pluralistic. So, you know, uh, yeah. a good actor yeah. plays different kind of roles. The same yeah. way a good writer 
can play different kind of roles. Yeah. Now, once you are this, you decide that you have to write a romantic song. Yeah. Well, bring yourself in that frame of mind, and your vocabulary will change accordingly if you have enough words at your disposal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and you will write accordingly, and if you have to write something harsh or something aggressive, then yeah. your vocabulary will change, your style will change. Like a good act. As a matter of fact, I think a professional writer, a dialogue writer. Or a, a film songwriter is, in a way, a dominant actor because you also perform different kind of situation. Okay. Uh, your pen and paper. Are you saying that you're not just sitting and imagining it, but do you do you get up and enact it to yourself sometimes when you're writing? Or no, when, you say, when you say dominant, it means it all happens within you, inside you, okay. but it happens. Now, the difference between acting is that it is physical and you can see people right. doing that. But uh, in writing, you just see that someone is writing. What yeah. is going in his head is, uh, I mean, you have yet to find an extra machine right. that will be able to catch that. I have another question for you. Now, I jumped into the film industry. You know, I, I always say to myself that Javid Sab, you are the longest surviving veteran of the film industry, and I'm the longest surviving newcomer. So, <laughs> as the longest surviving newcomer, you know, I've jumped into it when things have become far more irreverent, far more feministic. There's, there's a different kind of technology that's being used. It's not the film anymore, etc. And I know you are surrounded by a lot of strong, powerful women, which I'll come to later. But for someone like that, have you ever written one of those typical, um, you know, highly non-feministic, you know, the, the the girl as the trophy, as the arm candy type of? Have you written those kind of characters and no, 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 look back at it differently if you have? If you if you see a film, uh, most of uh, uh, my films and films that I wrote with Salim Sabu also uh, yeah. are male. Yeah? But at the same time, even if a woman has a cameo role, yeah. the woman is a working woman and has her own opinion, own personality, and own dignity. Yeah. Uh, you, you, whether you see Trishul, or whether you see Shakti, or you see uh, Diwar, uh, or anybody. These women are individual. They are yeah. not doormats. They're yeah. for sure. Uh, in any of Are them. you saying that about your writing? Or in general? No, no, uh, I'm talking about our films. Salim Javed and Phil yeah. Ote Pai wrote. Okay. Later. okay. So these women are strong women. These okay. women are not uh, bimbos. They are not uh, dumb blondes. Yeah. So, uh, but yes, uh, when I look back at my work, I do yeah. feel it's an honest condition that there are certain lines, yeah. certain scenes uh, yeah. today. And uh, that was uh, perhaps uh, uh, my thoughts about this matter were not that matured. I was not that clear. Like uh, in Sita or Gita. Uh, Which one? Sorry. Sita. Sita or Gita. Sita or Gita. Okay. When Sita comes in Gita's place, mm. her partner gets very impressed by her because she's a good cook and she can good, cook very good food. Mm. Perhaps today I won't do that. I mean, this is the sign of a good girl. You have written it very differently today. Yes, of course. Because of course. what actually worked there yeah. was the contrast between the two two girls. Thank you. And it worked again later so in many remakes. I will keep the contrast, but not this one. Okay. And not cook, and this one is a good cook. Because, you know, Javid Tab, ironically enough, one of the reasons why a lot of things worked in the past, not just in your scripts, but also in, in cinema and TV serials in general, even when you look at a very popular international series like Friends, mm -hmm. they are completely not politically correct. On the one hand, they should be, but on the other hand, they were not. And even mm -hmm. those things work. So, so you would, I, why don't you write another well, Sita or Gita for now? I can, I can think of that. that minor slip which I have made in some of the film, yeah. uh, like this one, that here is a girl who is Gita, who cannot cook, and comes yeah. Sita, who can cook. 
Now, this should not be the litmus uh, test of a good girl, you know, or so good girl. So, it was uh, slightly, I think, uh, careless of I would, I would urge you to write another Sita or Gita, 2.0 version. Just for that. <laughs> both of them I cannot. Think should put, yeah. With a final change, they, both of them cannot go. One of the other questions that I had was about um, your own, you know, when I look at your film career from outside, it seems like you've had, always had this grand success. You've always worked with blockbusters. You've just been ascending and ascending. So I want to know if you've ever faced a struggle, either financially or if a film failed or went to the cans without being made. Have you had that experience? It doesn't seem that way from the outside. Well, I had my quota of problems right from the right in the beginning. I yeah. came to Bombay in 64, yeah. uh, on, uh, October 4th. Yeah. And from there to January 1970. Okay. I've seen all kinds of problems that one can see, except that I did not come under a bus. I was not uh, uh, killed by a moving train. I did not uh, uh, get cancer. I didn't lose my eyesight or any limb. And besides that, all the problems I've experienced. Yeah. I've gone hungry for two days, three days, many times. I have spent months and months where I didn't know where I'll sleep. Uh, tonight, um, I have spent years, uh, at least couple or three years, couple of years or three years, when I would get up wherever I had slept in the night, I would know where the next meal will come from. So I've seen all this. But once in from January on or January 1970, uh, uh, yes, I mean, in any career, if the career is almost 50 years old, it cannot be on ascent and ascent, and I would be in the heavens if it would constantly ascend. So there have been lows and ups and lows and uh, ups and downs and so on. It has happened. Um, but uh, whatever problem I faced, I faced them comfortably. I was physically comfortable. Okay. So I was not bother where I'll sleep or where my next meal will come from or uh, 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 next month will I be on the pavement and so on. So that basic security and basic guarantee had come in my life. So then you can face problems. Problem do come in everybody's life. Nothing yeah. can totally smooth you. That's not possible. And particularly in a profession where... Not you, necessarily in everybody's life. You know, no, no, it does come. We, we see, we feel a lot of people yeah. must be thinking about me. So He has a life where he has no problem and everything right. is the roses. But it is not like that with anybody in the world. Everybody has problems. Well, you know, there are problems and there are problems. So I would say some lives have pretty much go by without any real problems. That too happens. So I wouldn't generalize it so much. <laughs> of real problem. You see, whatever my problem is, for me it is real. That's what? why you need to relate it to the world, don't we, yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah, and if I have a small problem and I don't have any big problem, then I'll yeah. treat this small problem as a big problem. Fair enough. Are there yeah. any questions? I'm trying to get yeah. some uh, viewers' so questions. So Where is it? Oh, okay. Let me just check. I'm going to just ask you a couple of viewers' questions. Um, I can't even read this. Okay. Aditya Ramji says, Sir, you mentioned that people have become indifferent and I wouldn't disagree entirely. This is a strong cultural shift that happens over time. The pandemic has also brought out relative vulnerabilities for each one across income strata. Would people only become more protective of their own selves, just like some of the shifts in geopolitics globally? More importantly, as cultural ambassadors, what do you think people like you need to do differently to bridge this divide? So you are an ambassador and you're a messiah, says Aditya Ramji. Do you have an answer? Well, thank you very much, Aditya Ramji, because you see, this compliment has uh, uh, put me on the level of my inadequacy. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, yes, I mean, uh, there'll be some people who will become perhaps more selfish, more self-protective, 
and think more about themselves only. There are people who will think about the society, but particularly the younger generation. Uh, one can see that they think collectively. They are not as individualistic in these matters. They have a concept of society. They have a concept of collective interest, and which is very healthy. That's wonderful. So I think I am not a pessimist. I have great hope for the future of our society, and I think that uh, uh, the next generation, by and large, is better people than us. So there is no reason why why tomorrow will not be better than today. Fair enough. One more question from Shaifuddin Khader Mohammed. Javed Akhtar sir, in spite of being a screenwriter and lyricist, being so closely involved in conceiving and executing so many film projects, how come you've never directed a film? Never been tempted to, to make direct a film? As a matter of fact, this is a million dollar question. Because when I was in college, my dream was to become a film director. And I had come to film industry. Yeah. I did not have any idea that I'll become a writer. I wanted to become a director. So I joined uh, Mr. Kamal Amruhi as an assistant director. Then really? after, uh, for a while, I worked with Mr. S.M. Sagar, who was making a film. Then after that, I worked with Mr. Brit Sadana, who was known for Victoria 203. Wow. Yeah, so I worked as an assistant director, and very seriously. I worked in the editing department. I worked on the sets and so on. So uh, you did all that before you became a screenwriter? Did that lead you to become? Yeah, it, that led me. And what happened that when I would work somewhere and the director is not happy, I mean, beside Kamal Saab, because Kamal Saab was a great writer himself. But after that, wherever I worked, so the director was not too happy with the scene and he wanted to change the dialogue, which was a common occurrence in those times. The scene would come on the set. So yeah, I would offer my services, sir, just to look useful. Uh, yeah. Uh, sir, may I change it? May, uh, whatever you're saying, I can do accordingly. And once I would write a scene, they'll ask me uh, uh, to yeah. writing scenes. Okay. And everybody whom I in touch with forced me and told me, you're a writer. What are you doing? Why are you an assistant director? You should become a writer. And ultimately, uh, I met Salim Saab in a film, as I told you, I worked with Mr. Asim Sagar. He was making a stunt film, mm. where Shakhtar was the hero, and the leading the romantic lead was done by Salim Saab. He was an actor in that film. Okay. And that is where we met, and I was an assistant, and I was writing the dialogue also. Okay. Within that salary, by the way. Wow. So, so he... <laughs> my work and he said you are a writer you should become a writer and okay. we became friends and one day we became partners so okay. i left uh, the direction department and he stopped acting and both of us became writers okay but you might still want to direct a film you think i mean you're perfectly in a position to do that whenever you want i am ma'am that's true uh, but perhaps now it's a bit late, maybe, but I still fantasize that's, that. That's a debatable point, yeah. so may not be too late. I want to come to another major legacy that you're leaving behind, or you already created, which is the Copyright Act, which you drove, which you architectured, and now you are the chairman of that, uh, is I, it a trust? I, or a, IPRS, Indian Performance. IPRS. Everybody, I mean, it became such a contentious and sort of turbulent issue in the industry because everyone sort of came with their own problems. The producer said, hey, we are taking all the risk. Now what's happening here? But I mean, fundamentally, the creator of any product or any creative endeavor ought to be the owner of the software of it, the creativity. But how has it played out in the field? What, what's going on with it? Is it working well? Yeah. It... The government of that time and the opposition unanimous, unanimously. There was yeah. total unanimity in both the houses on this bill. Uh, well, obviously, one had to talk to everybody, every party, every leader, yeah. and explain what are our demands and what do we need. Yeah. See, suppose a producer signs me. 
he give me money money to write song for his film i write the song he uses them in the film now when that song is taken out of the film and played on our television or on our fm radio or in a uh, cultural function i had not written the song for that i had written the song for the film right so he has given me given me my fees my remuneration whatever was mutually decided point i have no demand from him if the film is running in the theater it is his film if it is a hit it is his profit if it is a flop it is his loss i have nothing to do i had taken my money and thank you very much but if that song is taken out of the film and used somewhere else yeah and someone else is making money beside the producer like yeah. the television like the fm they run these their companies their show on these yeah. songs so they have to give me some royalty because right. they are doing my work that's about all this was the discussion the whole royalty was going to the music company or the producer yeah. and the writer and the composer were not getting any share now we have not invented the share the share was already always there but right. at the very first interaction between the uh, author and the producer or the author of the music company the author was forced to write a sign on the dotted line and surrender all the rights the rights already there now this amendment has only made one change that now you cannot surrender your right right no but Amish- how is it structured now now i mean if you look at reality shows yeah biggest money spinners are the music and dance shows i mean they are yeah. so are they is there a structure in place where they are paying yes. up is it is reaching a- the artists oh yes oh yes so obviously an individual an individual cannot yeah. cut his uh, or royalty from everywhere and our songs are played in canada in chile in argentina in england in canada leave aside india everywhere in yeah. middle east in gulf so how will i collect right so cannot do it so government yeah. have given uh, permission for uh, and recognize a society that this yeah. this is a society that is recognized by the government it will collect royalty on the behalf of the individual and cut 15% to run the society and rest of them will be distributed accordingly right and this is what is happening now and uh, you will be happy to know that i mean people who uh, used to get perhaps peanuts in one year they are getting sizable amounts every fourth month okay yeah this is a bit of a you know difficult i mean it did create some ripples in uh, the tamil film industry which i don't know if you are aware of when um, we were shri elaya raja sent off a notice shot off a notice to mr sp balasubramaniam when he was on an international tour saying that he cannot perform to elaya raja's songs and then you know there was a whole debate around that so um, i mean i think it's still work in progress for a lot of people they haven't internalized it so and that's a, that's a different uh, different case in different situation yeah. won't be able to pass any comment to that because i don't know the uh, nitty gritty of the yeah. uh, which i get over the understanding what was the contract between them i don't know right. so i won't make any comment about that but by large i think whether it is tamil film industry which is as big as any other or telugu film industry or hindi film industry or malayali film industry for that matter bengali punjabi yeah. all of us have the same rule and i think it has benefit across the uh, languages yeah. in every language today the composer and the writer are in uh, totally safe situation i think they are almost going to build a temple for you <laughs> coming to that point wait for my death no <laughs> build a temple for you for having done this yeah, but i think i'll move to my next question therefore yeah Imagine if somebody built a temple for an atheist. Where does your atheism well, come from? This, this And why are you an atheist? This, this won't happen for the first time. There have been many atheists, and now they are being worshipped. True. It's a it's a fact. Uh, yeah. Because uh, this society can't afford atheists. So what they do? All right. If he's not a believer, we'll believe him and turn him into a god. <laughs> But where? 
You don't <laughs> want to open another account. <laughs> but where does your atheism come from? from Why thinking. are you an atheist? I just, I'm just curious. It's so simple because I think, and anybody who, anybody who will seriously, objectively think about these matters will become an atheist. People are religious because they don't think. They think about other things, not that they are they are retarded or they are a missile. I don't mean that. They are very smart people, clever people. They are running their business. They are scholars. They are scientists and religious uh, and so on. But they don't think about this department. They, they don't have, think about, sorry? This particular topic, they don't think. They, otherwise, they are smart people. They are doing wonderful things in their life. They are successful businessmen. They are successful sportsmen. They are successful uh, writers even. And yeah. poets and so on. And yeah. politicians. But they never think about this issue. They have whatever has been served to them. They have accepted. It was given to them on a platter. They took it without questioning it. And they don't want to question. Because they feel that uh, that will be very disturbing. Uh, yes and no. I mean, I know a lot of believers who do think. Maybe they believed after thinking. Possible. Not all of them, but I'm saying it's possible that you investigated and interrogated a certain belief and then you got convinced by it or you did not get convinced by it. So, religion has certain inherent contradictions. I yeah. don't know what people don't think. You know, there are different kinds of religions in the world. Now, Abrahamic religions are different, like Judaism, Christianity, Islam. In uh, Sanatan Dharm, these are uh, another philosophy. Yeah. And in uh, if you go to Far East, uh, in China, in uh, uh, Japan, you will find religions which are thing in a different manner. Yeah. But one thing for sure that you cannot be a religious person without believing yeah. that there is a supreme being. Yeah. You have to believe in any yeah. form, a supreme being who is omnipotent. Okay. Do you believe that? No, of course not. You don't. If but you, you believe the force of nature. What kind of a question is this? If I believe you, that I am an atheist. Do you not believe that nature is supreme? No, no. That, no that nature is supreme. So I mean, even an elephant is supreme. <laughs> Wait, the elephant and a, a, a bird is supreme because the bird can fly, I can't, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I have my limitation, but uh, the fact is that nature also has certain limitations. Sure. Whatever the nature is doing, do you really believe that uh, uh, there is a supreme being who is bothered about my marriage, about my job, about the future of my son, about the wedding of my daughter? Really? There is a supreme being who is going to decide all this. Which, what do you think? We know soon, you know, when we all want to pass on, we know. As a matter of fact, it, it is very difficult to talk about it seriously. I can see that. You're yeah. making me laugh when I don't yeah. want to laugh. Yeah. If, yeah. if there is a supreme being that yeah. is omnipotent, yeah. who controls everything, then how there is sin? Past life ka na? and future life. Ka. It's a cycle. Many sin to past life may be ne ho sakta because still yeah. without his permission cannot happen. He is the only. Javid Sab, I am not winning this round with you. Okay. No, no, I am asking you. You see. No, I don't know. For me, it's a mysterious no, thing which such people believe is destiny. <laughs> everything is written. If everything is written, I am not a sinner. I mean, the script was written for me and I'm only following the script. No, no, no. I think we are 25% stakeholders in this project. So we cannot afford to sin. There are many theories, but I'm not going to go into that now because you'll demolish me further. But, but I'm going to ask you an audience question, Javed Sam. It is how people uh, save their faith. They don't get into a avenue where their faith can be demolished. It is <laughs> it's the only way to remain faithful. That is true. I think not, the fear of being demolished is not a good fear. One audience question from Sam Amin. She wants to know not were there any people who inspired your work 
or anyone's work or career that inspired you, either at oh, the beginning. Oh, yeah. or... oh yes, of course. of course. Yeah. I was uh, thankfully I was inspired by more than one source. Uh, you know, when uh, you are inspired or you are impressed by yeah. one particular source, yeah, then uh, you tend to become an echo instead of a voice. Yeah, you are influenced by many different. Uh, Sources yeah. like my one source was uh, progressive writers uh, who wrote uh, novels, short stories, and with uh, contemporary values about uh, social justice, about women in, in uh, emancipation, and uh, uh, against uh, communal ideas, thoughts, yeah. narrow mindedness, against religiosity and uh, the regressive tradition. One another was great source was. Uh, American contemporary American novels, where you see, when I was a kid, I started reading novels at a very young age, 12, 13. I wrote, uh, read, say, Maxim Gorky's mother when I was 13. I don't know how much I understood. So, You're my precocious child, yeah. Uh, my parents and my elders used to tell me that when you are reading a novel, you have to be patient for first 40 uh, pages. Because only after 40 pages, you will really get into the story and you will understand the character. Mm. Now, those are the tradition novels. Now, the contemporary American novels catch you by the collar in the first paragraph. Because mm. otherwise, you will put down the book. People's attention is passed as shrunk. So, this kind of crispness and this mm. kind of smartness appeal to me. Mm. On one side, on the other side, the content, to a great extent, came to me, or the ideology or the thoughts came to me from the progressive writers. And they were then Urdu is a language where a language is not we treat language not just a so vehicle for communication, but mm. it is a fine art in itself. Mm. So language for language sake, that is also there. Mm. So a phrase and how to use this word and this word it doesn't sound sound good. There are many couplets of Ghalib who were taken out by his peers whom he gave his book uh, collection that now whatever you want to cut from it you can. So they removed some very good couplets because the sound was not right. Mm. All these things were important and I was trained uh, and I grew up with Urdu poetry. So mm. all these sensibilities came from different sources. Mm. A good cinema I mean, I think in my impressional age, Guru Dutt uh, impressed me very much. Dilip um, you know, Kumar and Ganga Jamna and Mother India, these were the pictures who mm -hmm. left a very deep impression on me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you are open to learn and uh, you don't decide, you start going to start worshipping anyone or any institution, mm -hmm. then you are right. So, my sources were multiple and I when I, uh, I talk to young people or students in school or college I tell them you must read but please don't read only classic mm. don't read only great novels you must read pulp oh. you must read paper bags which are available on the railway station need film fair and stardust oh yes do that because otherwise in a young age if you start reading war and peace there is a danger that you may dry up you may become too serious at such a young age. That is also dangerous. That no, is also. But I think I think Javid Sab, it's not about reading everything, probably, but don't you think it's also about processing what you read, how you receive it? Yes, but uh, don't 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 serve only one dish. Fair enough. That is not healthy. Yeah. You should have humor. You should have light romantic novels, short yeah. stories. You should have mystery. And you should have serious, real literature. Right. Or, or, mm. that, but it should not be the only stable uh, mental uh, food mm. for you. Mm. Mm. That can be dangerous. You can become yeah. arrogant. You can become dry and uh, a kind of... Uh, you. It means you are biting more than you can chew. That you should do. Okay, there's one question from Karundel Rajesh, who's a very eminent script writer. He seems to be online. He's oh, a writer here and he's also my writer. So mm. he says, 
did you ever face a writer's block this is a very frequent and practical issue in a screenwriter's life how would you suggest to get over it from your experience asking this since your practical answer will surely benefit many that's one the second question is conceiving new scenes and maintaining creative flow through the screenplay were there any inspirations for you when you came to screenwriting how did you understand and master the art okay this is not a master class but if you can give a generic answer to both the questions one is about writer's block and about mastering the art of screenwriting from karandil rajesh yes 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 i have i have experienced it many times not once you see and uh, uh, that was the time when i was busy writing uh, uh, scripts after script and that was the time when uh, there was no television uh, so often i used to fantasize that here is a producer who has no idea that i can't write a single line now whatever i could i have already written i'm totally empty vacant vacuous i have nothing this producer doesn't know he has given me very big amounts signing amount and he thinks that i'll be able to write a script which i can't obviously so what should i do and i used to fantasize that i should run away go to a small town change my name i start living there and nobody would know that i am the writer who had run away after the turning about so i have faced this many times you know they say when you are working and uh, when you are working you feel like god and creator it happened much later the work humiliates you in the beginning it rubs your nose on the carpet you feel you are totally incompetent you won't be able to write two li proper lines and as a matter of fact when you start writing you look at that say this is what i am writing i hope nobody sees the tire rest of this you throw the paper gradually i mean you feel like a cockroach and then gradually somehow because you are asking for mercy you cry and then you get some break and gradually the break starts becoming the light comes in your life and yes then you are at control then you do feel like a creator and god that's true and that's the great did you just say god did you just say god you know, yeah 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 i mean it's the part of a dictionary so i mean why should i waste that okay. word Uh, use it in a more practical. <laughs> okay. So, uh, anyway, so then you feel like a very strong. And as a matter of fact, sometimes very rarely, but sometimes I have experienced one thing, and I'm sure that uh, your uh, friend who is a scriptwriter would uh, definitely share this uh, experience, uh, knowledge of this experience. Sometimes you start relating to a certain character. and you feel that the character is alive and when you know after three scenes the character scene will come so you genuinely while writing you wait for the third scene because you want to know what this person is going to say now right what will he say and you discover the person as if the person on is alive on the paper and telling you write down this yeah this is a rare experience but it happens and uh, that's unbelievable that's a great pleasure to discover a character and the character tells you what to write wow okay there's one more question from jay shri aradhyam sir writers are known to shut themselves off from the world to write however what does a forced lockdown like the present times do to a creative mind it's a very interesting question actually because when you shut yourself off out of choice you're doing yeah. it for a certain kind of freedom and space yeah and but even when this uh, this this uh, shutting down oh, imposed on you then to what do you what choice you have as a matter yeah. of type the reading thinking writing what else you can do uh, so what i think all the writers and all the people who are in this business must be doing uh, they have no choice what else they will do they can't party they can't go outside they can't sit in offices they can't go to their friends to gossip and all and uh, uh, so Yes, I mean, uh, I have written quite a lot. I have written uh, three poems so far. I'm a very slow poet. I take my own time till I'm not sure that yes, this idea has not been used before. I don't write the poem. Yeah. So, 
I have written three poems in these last three months. Wow. Because I'm going to hear two lines at the end of this. Let's see. There's just one more question from Pavitra Ramesh, who's by the way a singer, and she says, "In your view, is the industry is the music industry robust across the board in order to be able to make this royalty system viable? What about people who aren't in a position to pay royalty?" She says, "If it's going to be across the board, then uh, if, let's assume there's a really small singer who's just doing his or her first tour." Of film music, maybe. No, no. You, you, you. If you take some writer's lyric, yeah, you don't have to pay royalty, uh, and uh, well, you have to pay him something because you are using his work. So uh, he also has one stomach, you know. So he also needs some uh, some crumbs of bread. But how do you monitor these hundreds of stage shows that are going on? No, no. Commercial. He or her. Yeah. You don't pay the royalty. the royalty is paid by the end user if you have taken my lyric and you compose it and you make a song you have given me some fees whatever x amount for the song finish my financial relationship with you is over that time the moment you have given my full and final now if the song is played on the radio and the radio person is making money on it so he should pay some royalty to you And some royalty to me, so the end user has to pay the royalty, not you. Right, right. I think that's still to be understood. I think the nuances of this new copyright act needs to be understood better. I think. So um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was: Have you ever thought of conducting rigorous screenplay, you know, workshops or training courses? Or, because i think one of the biggest lacunae in the industry is screenwriting i mean we we might romanticize it but really i mean and given the number of platforms we need more screenwriters to be not a formally trained screenplay writer i have not done any course and as a matter of fact i must confess to you that i have not read a single book how to write a screenplay yeah in four easy lessons no i have not i have learned on the job and uh, i must give some credit in this matter to salim sahab because salim sahab knew screenplay much more than me to begin with because he had already worked under certain uh, uh, screenplay writers like mr abrar and we so so he had a much better understanding of what is a screenplay than me yeah and when i worked with him yes yeah. that was my forte but screenplay is another thing you know so I learned screenplay while working with him, and um, so I have learned on the job. And uh, thanks to Salim sir, as a matter of fact. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to shift back for a minute and ask you something that I'm really curious about, which is your presence on Twitter. How on earth do you handle the toxic trolls and you know the repartees? and very often the stupidities i mean i'm working on the convinced hypothesis that you are far more intelligent than most of the others who come at you how do you handle it does it not stress you out more often than not i don't uh, respond but sometimes i do because they should know they are not the only ones who can be rude so uh, when i answer them it is uh, a pretty okay aggressive and strong answer uh, yeah. but then when he gets bored acha chalo do baar ho gaya let's forget it <laughs> then i understand these people yeah. many of them are paid people they are certain parties they have their own cell they pay people to uh, to a certain yeah number of uh, yeah and so on so that's their job they are getting 10 to 15000 rupees per month that's all yeah. and there are some people who are really stupid enough to be totally right this so uh, sometimes you contradict them and sometimes you forget about it but uh, it doesn't disturb me as a matter of when i'm uh, uh, replying or responding i thoroughly enjoy them you but do uh, yeah, oh yeah okay so well, i'm equally mean so <laughs> so <laughs> i got to take out my no, i'm so you... glad you're able to chuckle about it ah so what yeah ah. 
Okay, okay, I'm just going to do a little fun round with you now. It's going to be fun. Just for four or five questions and just answer it for a lark. You know, I'm just copying somebody else's rapid fire business. Your favorite screenplay of your own screenplays, which is your own favorite of, of a screenplay that you've written. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to write it. Really? You mean the Sita or Gita 2.0 version? I have, I mean, that's my next project. My favorite screenplay. Oh, I thought that was going to be for me, no? No, no, I'm going to write to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Your favorite screenplay of someone else or a favorite screenplay writer yeah. other than yourself? I'll, I'll, I'll restrict to only Hindi cinema, otherwise, I mean, there are many pictures uh, in yeah. continental film, though you can talk about it. American. Well, let's talk about <laughs> India. Let's talk about, I'll say Mugli Azam or a great screenplay. Anand was a great screenplay. Um, uh, uh, Kanun was a great screenplay. Sorry? Kanun. And um, uh, I uh, have liked, uh, uh, from a screenplay point of view and dialogue, uh, yeah. Goya's film uh, uh, Gully Boy also. So, so yes. Exceptional screenplay. Uh, so a lot of people are doing extremely well. Masan was a very good screenplay. Um, yeah. But is there one screenplay uh, writer who you think is just up there other than yourself? You see, I mean, you can say this is a very good screenplay, but to call somebody a very good screenplay a writer, I have to see at least three, four, five films of that standard. Then I'll say this is a very good screenplay writer. Otherwise, I'll only say that this is a good screenplay. Okay. You're not a monotheist in general. Okay. So, what is your favorite lyric of what you have written? Some song that you still look back and say, gosh, did I really write this? No, you, you had asked me what is my favorite screenplay also, which I have written. Believe yeah. me, I'm not saying because what a nice thing to say and it will show me in such a good light. Yeah. Don't get attached to the work that I have already done. You may or may not believe the film that I had written in the 70s, I had seen them only in the 70s. I've never seen them again. Really? The song I have written, I remember my literary poetry. I don't even remember my song that I write. Mm. Because it is commercial work. I have done to my best uh, capability and mm. capacity. I have handed over to the music director, somebody with a much better voice than mine has sung it. And it is in public domain. So fine. So now my umbilical cord is cut. So that was, you know, in 87, I had written a song. I mean, this idea frightens me. Would you believe that I was in the parliament till 19, uh, sorry, 2016. Hmm. This is 2020, four years. My uh, tenure got completed in 2016. I have the right and I have the identity card. So we've got parliament and sit in the hall and have tea there. I have not yet gone there even once. Because now it will be like sitting on the past laurel. Why should I go now? I'm not a member anymore. It's okay. You know, I thoroughly enjoyed those six years. Okay. But it's over. And I when I was there, I could see so many people who were once upon a time members of the parliament, they would come there, old people, and sit there alone. So I used to feel sorry for them. If you are too attached to your past, it means you have no hope for the future. Right. No, I mean, I, I'm not saying you have to live in the past, but a lyric or a song, you could hear it somewhere. Yes, Someone's I mean, playing a it song which is very you. popular, but I am not emotionally attached to any of it. That's amazing. That's quite amazing. Not... And very unusual, actually. I think most people like to revisit oh, their work, you know? Okay. But do you have a... <laughs> I'm trying to make my silver future. <laughs> Fair enough. You're still young enough to do that. Yeah. Do yeah. you have a favorite lyricist other than yourself? Oh, yes. Indian. I think Sahir was a great songwriter. Sorry? Sahir Vidyanvi. Okay. Or Sharan. They were different schools. But they were the masters of their schools. Mm. And uh, I, I mean, I'll be very happy to know that, to feel that I've written something as good as him. Yeah. Look at my humility. 
Yeah. I'm but, quite amazed. Yeah. I'm quite amazed. But, but that's, deep, what kept, that's what kept you alive in kicking. Yeah. Who is the favorite music director that you've worked with? Hardy Barman. Really? Yeah. You worked so many songs with him, no? Uh, yeah. What was it like? Was he I worked with many music directors, but Hardy Barman, and today if you ask me who is your favorite, I'll say Shankar Isan Loy. Sorry? Today I'll say Shankar Isan Loy. But yeah. uh, before that, they were not even on that scene that time when Adi was there. Yeah. Uh, it was a pleasure working with him. What is it like but working with Shankar? I like Shankar, uh, Lakshmi Kant, Alilal, yeah. Jatin Ayat, uh, Annu Malik. Yeah. Uh, Annu Malik is very underrated. As a matter of fact, what oh, he's made some beautiful songs. <laughs> Classic uh, songs. Yeah. yeah. And um, Shivhari, with whom I started writing lyrics, all yeah. of them. Are, that's why they are there. Uh, True. You know no, but is there a difference between now if you take Shankar Ehsan Loy I'm not going to go to another music director because Shankar Ehsan Loy compose you know they have composition value to what they do so I want you to com contrast them with the earlier music directors that you worked with who also have composition value is there a contrast is there a difference because they I I suspect, correct me if I'm wrong, I suspect that Shankar Hassan Loy work from here, you know, they, they compose from here. They don't necessarily depend on gadgets to do that, is the sense I get by oh, listening to their compositions. They are a great team, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. So is there, a, is there any contrast between then and now? They, are, they, are, they cover the whole, uh, shall I say, sargam of music, from yeah. one to another, the whole uh, horizon. Is covered by three of them, uh, and uh, Shankar, without exaggeration, is a genius. There is no doubt about it. He's an exceptional talent, exceptional talent, mm -hmm. and so was Ali Barman, for that matter, um, and so is A. R. Rahman. Mm -hmm. They are exceptional, exceptional mm -hmm. people. Yeah, uh, but um, Ali, best of his work. Best of his tunes were made in three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. That's all. I mean, he would do all these things so casually, mm. so spontaneously that you would not realize that what great work he has done. You will understand it after a little while. That, oh God, this is what he composed. This is what he did. <coughs> this, this is true of Shankar Isan also. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And um, one question that I have for you, which I've been wondering about for a long time, you come from a family, you are a family, that's like a mini film industry. It's not like a first family cinema, it's like a mini industry. And I'll tell you why. You have all these, you, you have children, you have two generations in your household, which has not overwhelmed each other. I mean, normally when you look at, you know, star homes, you find that the children are overwhelmed by the parents. And the converse can also happen when parents slowly sort of stand in the wings and watch their children and preen about them. Both happens. Now, there's something very unusual about... There are families where everybody flourishes, but they're not usually from the same field. They're not usually. In your family, with you and... Shabanaji and Farhan and Zoya all blossomed, all have their individuality. It's like an equal society. I mean, this is not natural. How, how you know, did this all, I can say, all I can say equal, is that in our, egalitarian. How, how did this happen? In, a, in our family, we have a tradition. Yeah. Uh, the only tradition that we have in our family yeah. is that we don't follow tradition. You see, my father was a poet, and his father was a poet, as I told you. But if you look at their poetry, my grandfather's poetry is totally different. Yeah. And my father's poetry is totally different from my grandfather's poetry. And my poetry is totally different from my father's poetry. So somehow we were never overawed by our elders and uh, found our own voice, good or bad, whatever. 
Uh, same way, generally what happens that if uh, the parents are successful in a particular kind of film, particular genre, they are known for a particular genre, so the youngsters try to get into their genre, at least in the beginning. Uh, they would make a romantic film, the father used to make romantic film, and so on and so forth. But uh, you can see Farhan's first film, Dil Chata Hai, or Zoya's first film, that is Luck by Chance, or uh, film that follow. There is no influence of my film on their work, yeah. at all. Yeah. At, yeah. And uh, as far as Shamana is concerned, when I met Shamana, Shamana was an icon anyway. Yeah. Oh, how could I influence her? <laughs> I was trying to save myself from too much of it. Uh, so, yeah. uh, uh, so uh, they are people in their own right. And they are successful in their own right by doing their own work. And uh, they respect each other. All of us respect each other. There is no doubt about it that we have respect for each other. I mean, I won't be saying something great that I respect Shabana's work. What else I'll do? I have to. It's so good. Uh, and vice versa, Shabana has to have some kind of uh, respect for me as a writer. Otherwise, you will think that she doesn't understand writing. Uh, but uh, on the other side, you know what happens that you try to be patronizing or condescending to the children. I don't think that uh, I am guilty of that. They are people of their own mind. I never give them any advice or suggestion till they don't ask for it. Mm -hmm. And when give, I give my advice or my suggestion, that too, there is no guarantee that it will be accepted. Sometimes they accept it, sometimes they don't. It's their yeah. life. Uh, but I'm very happy that they are successful, but I'm even more happy that they are happy, they are successful by doing good work. Yeah. There are certain restraints, there are certain hold bars in them. It is yeah. their ethics, it's their morality, uh, it is the value system that stops them from doing anything. Yeah. Uh, now, how they develop this aesthetic, how they develop this morality, how they develop this sensibility. I mean, uh, sometimes people say, Dekhi, aapke bachche to aapke ki Aisa kuch nahi hota. <laughs> Yes, of course, there is a process of osmosis which yeah. was certain values enter in you because they are yeah. around all around you. But then they are intelligent people. They have their own mind. They yeah. could decide anything. They decided this. Yeah. Wonderful. No, no, Javid sir, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm still trying to crack that because I come from a family that's so remote from cinema. I jumped into it quite late. And so there's no need what? to coexist in the same realm, if you know what I'm saying. But your family, all of you are embedded. What is that? How how did you become so equal, if I may use that word? It's like an equal society. What is that process? What is that psyche? It's very unusual. That's why I'm kind of interrogating this further. No, no, not at all. But uh, you see, the fact is that it, it, there is no formula. Yeah. You have to respect people. You have to respect people who are younger than you. You have to respect people who are even your children. After a certain age, they are adults. They are as much people as you are. And uh, they have right to their opinion, they have right to their privacy, they have right to their dignity. Yeah. If you accept that, then what's the problem? It's easily said, but I kudos to you for actually practicing that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that you must be very impressed by that. And one more question, at the risk of flattering you, you know, most people, when they spend a long time in any field, not particularly in the creative field, the older chronologically they grow, the more they have to force themselves to be relevant to the field. It's more and more and more contrived. It becomes more forced. It becomes more a force of their own presence in the field. It's not some way they start getting dated. How on earth have you survived? I mean, you're like Saroj Khan on steroids. I mean, you've survived three and a half generations of the film industry effortlessly. There's no need for you to force yourself to feel relevant. You're very much a person of today and yesterday and I have no doubt tomorrow. What, what is it that makes you stay evolved? Being evolved is one thing, but being with the moment effortlessly. I think that's what I'm asking. I don't know. I mean, uh, there is an inherent compliment in this uh, question. 
and accepting this question is uh, like accepting the compliment also. Please uh, do. <laughs> right. But uh, the fact is that you can only be interesting as long as you are interested. If you are not interested, you will not be interested. If you have all the answers, then there cannot be any conversation. Yeah. If you are curious, if you are willing to learn, and you are never too old to learn, and you accept the fact that there are certain aspects of life that younger people understand better than you. There are certain things that you know they don't know and you should share with them because you also have inherited that information, that knowledge. Uh, somebody has given you this wealth. So you hand it over to the next generation. But next generation has also earned something. Yeah. And you don't know what is that because ultimately, as a matter of fact, the world belongs to them. Exactly. They were, and try to understand what they want and what they see and what they think and what is their problem, what is their yeah. desire, what they actually, uh, what is their aesthetic. If we understand that in all humility, right. then they can be a give and take. The moment I have this attitude, that I know. So basically, what you're saying is maintain. Right. I think what you're saying is maintain your curiosity to the world, is what you're saying. Yeah, if you're, if you're interested in life, you're in the world. If you're interested in what is happening, then you will remain uh, relevant and contemporary. Yeah. If you are not interested, then how can you be contemporary? Yeah. Right. And and fake this interest. Okay, Love it, sir. It has to be We're coming towards the tail end. Right. Okay. Getting frozen. You're getting frozen a little bit. I'm just trying to. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. You were saying, Javed, sir? I was not sure. I was motionless. Yeah. There was a difference. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't be so motionless. It doesn't suit you. <laughs> Please be totally in motion. So I was going to ask you, you said you've written some poems during the lockdown. Oh, it's a long time. Give us two lines and a translation. I'll send it to you. It's in very simple language, so you won't have any problem at all. I'll email it to you in uh, Roman. Because it's a long okay. poem. So, uh, okay. Yeah. I think you're getting frozen again. Have you gone motionless? As a matter of fact, you're going motionless quite no. often. Now you're okay. Okay. It's not working properly. You're going motionless again. Yes. I can see you now. You're yes, you're there. Mm. I see you. I just mm. thought you may want to say some to me. Bad. No? Yeah. Yeah, the connection well, is going off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can hear you. What is the question? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Question was, do you have any two lines from the top of your head? Here, poetry, I'll send it to you, I promise. Okay. I'll send it. okay. Okay. So um I really don't have anything else to ask you in the public domain. I will come and talk to you about your Sita or Gita 2.0. Sooner yeah, sure. than later, yeah. and I'm and I'm remembering a song which you wrote, which applies to you and me and the world around us in a very metaphorical sort of way. Let's sing it together. You know which song I'm talking about? Yes. Kismat se tum hamko mile ho kaise chodenge. Very good. You know what's wonderful about this? It's one of those songs of yeah. mine I have not written. This you've written? No, I plead not guilty. Really? But it, the internet says you've written the song. Oh, I don't trust the internet for it. It's been attributed to you. I have not. Tell me a song you've written which we can hum. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to um, spend another minute with you and yeah. then I'm going to log off. I don't okay. think there are any more questions either. 
So um, thank you, Javed Sab. This was just the first discussion that we're having online. I do not want everybody to know everything about you straight away. So maybe we'll do another discussion another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And I'll see you again soon. And don't forget the Sita or Gita 2.0. That's Darun. going to be the next inflection point of screenwriting. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, Bye-bye. And thank you, viewers, for joining us. And uh, this was a huge privilege. He's one of the most amazing men that I will ever know. Thank and I you. hope that we will all meet him again soon like this. Bye, Javitsa. Thank you.